If you're new here, my name is Jade. I used to be known as Lipstick and Curls way back in the day. I've been on YouTube for a while, but I'm kind of in this new season where I am trying to essentially like start fresh, start new. <laughs> been keeping up with me on social media on Instagram TikTok, all the things and you've been already kind of up to speed on where I'm at in my life on my spiritual walk with Christ as a mom as a wife all the things so I wanted to actually take the time in this video while I take my little nails off and put on these new press-ons that I got because I've been doing my own nails lately these are actually the Apre nails like the gel x nails so i get the tips off of amazon get all the other tools off amazon and i do these little babies by myself i had these on for a little over two weeks i had one that was kind of coming off so i just popped it off and put some nail glue on it popped it back on and we're still here but other than that none of these other ones are budging at all but they do look like ready to be redone like they're growing out so I wanted to take them off, throw on these press-ons that I got from HEB the other day. They're from Clutch Nails. They're golden, like a little French Manny look. And I've never used this brand of press-on before. I have used press-on press -on nails in the past a lot, but I haven't worn them in a minute. So I was like, ooh, these are cute. I'll try these after I you know, take these off. Uh, but if you wanna see how I actually put these nails on, put a comment down below or like this video and I will do that. Before we get started, let me tell you all the things that I got here to take these nails off. I've got my cotton swabs. Okay, I've got some aluminum foil. I just broke them up into like little pieces here. Also have my 100% acetone. Okay, it has to be 100%. I also have one of these, which is like a cuticle pusher thing. So I feel like I've told this story on different platforms in the past. Like I've shared parts of this story on my podcast with my husband, the Gobble Life Podcast. The Lord has greenlit us to start recording a season two, like an official season two of the podcast. And so I'm so excited about that because it's gonna be, it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be like that, I already know. I've had a social media presence since I was 12, 13 years old, I'm 32 now, okay? So I've had like multiple eras on the internet, but none of those eras included me being like a christian influencer or content creator like i always i always claimed god i always claimed christ but i definitely wasn't living in all seasons i would say there were there a couple seasons really one season in my mind that i know that i was actually like changing my walk and i was uh pursuing christ in a real way but then i fell off basically um, I got caught up in life, caught up in things. And that's kind of like what I wanted to talk about today was just like what that was like and what my journey with Christ has been like through and through really tell you all the story for me so that as we continue to like have these conversations about Christ and marriage and family and how I perceive womanhood and femininity and all those things on this channel, on my platform, y'all know like where I'm coming from and y'all know like the backstory of it all in one place in one setting um, it's my testimony you know we are saved by you know the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony right so i gotta tell y'all my testimony at every chance i can so as i'm sitting here with these <laughs> things on my hands we are gonna talk about how Christ really entered my life and into my heart. I mean, he's always been there, right? Like Christ created everything, was there in the beginning, will be there at the end. And um, yeah, just like how I came into like where I'm at right now. So to take it all the way back, I first just began to learn about him when I was in preschool. I went to a Christian preschool. My parents at the time were married. They got divorced when I was like four or five, four. Um, but at this time I was preschool, so this was around that time. We were living in Guam as a family. My parents were in the military in the Air Force. Me and my twin sister went to a private Christian school. And I remember it. Like I remember 
going to chapel. I remember learning about the Bible and God. And I also remember learning what work ethic meant and what working on stuff meant, like in a school academic capacity. I remember even different activities we had done in class and like just being in that academic environment for the first time. I have a lot of memories of that. This was probably like 95, 96. And I remember even like being at school singing songs. Oh God, this is gonna be so terrible. But this is, this is my life, this is my testimony. So I remember being in my Christian preschool classroom and I'm working on a worksheet and I'm literally singing Touch Me, Please Me by Case <laughs> as I'm <laughs> working preschool because my parents didn't really like quote unquote shield me from like the world or like secular music or anything like that they were not like that like I listened to whatever they were listening to and touch me please me was a popular song at the time so I was singing that in my head and literally I remember this and so I went to that school for maybe like a year or two and then went to kindergarten had my first crush in kindergarten and I remember being so embarrassed because my teacher or somebody told the parents of this little boy that I had a crush on told him or her that I had a crush on her son and like made it a big thing and I was so embarrassed because I was like why are you telling my business so I was outside of the Christian environment at that time my parents didn't go to church on Sundays or anything but that was my one experience that one year or two years I don't even know how long we went there um at that preschool and getting that Christian foundation and it that stuck with me even through my life my parents not really making church a priority but they considered themselves christians and we were also living overseas at this time so like we left guam my parents got divorced um i moved with my mom and my stepdad to turkey izmir turkey and that was obviously it's a muslim country so i for the next three years of my life in elementary school went to a school in the middle of a muslim city where you heard the prayer calls five times a day and we didn't live on base like we lived amongst like on the economy is what they call it it's like with the people and my parents didn't even wear like army or like you know not army because they're in the air force but they didn't even wear like fatigues or anything bdus is what they used to call them but they didn't wear those things because like we have to blend in <laughs> with the people so it was a very interesting experience to live there but as a child you know i loved it i loved the people there i loved the turkish people i loved the culture i loved everything about it it was a beautiful country they were all so kind so nice so i grew up with like this like feeling of like even though people are different you don't need language to describe love or feel kindness or feel comfort and all those kinds of things as we li lived there i was friends with another family and they would take me to church and i remember i joined the choir when i was in like third grade and and would go to sunday school and it was only when they would really take us because my mom didn't make it a priority really and I remember being by myself and like waiting for my friends and their family to come pick me up and take me to church. So that was when I really was like, you know, I felt like I had a special connection with Christ. I wanted to know about him even at a young age. And then fast forward, we moved to the States. Well, we moved to Germany after Turkey. So we lived in Turkey for a little while. I spent like my middle school years in Germany. We didn't really go to church then either at all. And then, and that's when I really was like, you know, in my, because I had my first drink, my first alcoholic drink when I was 12 and I bought it myself in Germany because drinking laws and stuff, age is different there. Moved to Texas in eighth grade and we didn't go to church either. <laughs> that's when a lot of stuff, even in my family life at home started to get a bit rough. It kind of got rough in Germany um, when I was in middle school and things um, I experienced some verbal emotional and physical abuse um, in my household during those years and so I essentially wanted to 
just do my own thing. It made me very independent. It made me very like focused on, on really self, just like independence, but also my dad lived in a different place. His household was ran totally differently. Honestly, my dad's household was very healthy. And because it was so healthy, I almost felt like odd whenever we went there. And then I also had this like dynamic of like being mixed. So like my mom is black and my dad is white and my dad remarried a white woman and I had two white brothers with them. And then my mom remarried a white man. So my brother and sister on her side are mixed like us. We just have different dads. And so I really struggled with identity in that sense back then. I really struggled with like, okay, who am I here and who am I there? And also kind of being in this space of like, just being a teenager and wanting to be grown and being immersed in all this like very, you know, overexposed sexuality in the world that we live in. And, but still like a good girl at heart. Um, and I didn't really have any sort of like um, parental like encouragement to like go to church or anything because they didn't want to force us to do anything. We went to church with my dad a few times, but whenever we went to church with my dad, it was like a white church and it just, I could never connect. So it was like not even the same. Like when I had those like experiences as like a little kid, like feeling very like connected and like wanting to learn more about Christ but by the time I was going to church here and there with my dad it was like I'm I feel so uncomfortable here and I'm also really uncomfortable with like walking around with my white dad sometimes because people stared at us all the time like y'all see my skin color and my dad is very white and my stepmom is very white and as I love them dearly and they've always just been there like they have been so solid my entire life it was hard for me. And honestly, it was even harder for me than it was for my sister, first of all, my twin. Because I don't think she really took to that as much as I did. I think I was just very sensitive to these things. And that's just me as a person. And so fast forward, um, go to college, and I ended up joining a sorority. And that sorority at the time was the closest thing that I had to a solid sense of like community and sisterhood and whenever we did like our sorority week we would always start it off with church and even in our like rituals and things like that like there was scripture and we were considered ourselves like a christian organization i don't know how much y'all have been tapped in with me lately but i did denounce that sorority i posted about denouncing i actually spiritually denounced like early this year it just took me some time to actually like say it out loud even that journey of like going from the only time i really had a relationship with god or like started to live a lifestyle with God involved, it was with those sorority sisters helping me. So I had sorority sisters that would have me on prayer calls, doing Bible studies together, um, going to church together. Those were the only times that I actually developed a relationship with Christ and even exposed myself to it outside of like um, what I did as a kid. Then I had a really rough time after I graduated from undergrad. And if you've been around that long, you can remember a video that I posted actually um, just talking about like the downfall after like coming out of college and just feeling like, wow, like I was like a big shot on campus and I was doing all these things and I had all this confidence and then I exit. I don't get accepted into the grad school I wanted to go to. My financial aid fell through for the one that I did want to go through. I ended up moving in with like my boyfriend at the time who was my high school sweetheart, but then he actually went to the NFL and so I moved with him to the city where he was a rookie. He ends up getting hurt like in preseason. So he's at home hurt, depressed. We fighting all the time. We're just, you know, we're shacking up. So it's just a lot. And I remember even one night, this is like maybe a few days before we like broke up and I moved back to Texas he was like reading his Bible. And I remember walking in on him reading his Bible, which I had never seen him do that in the seven years we had been together, known each other. And we were having premarital sex and all that kind of stuff. Like we were, you know, a normal quote unquote, like high school sweetheart, college boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, and so, you know, he's reading his Bible and I asked him like, you know, what are you reading? And he got angry with me. Um, 
I think that he, I wasn't understanding that he needed that for him. And it's a bit more detailed than that, but, but to keep this story going, I wasn't in a place that was encouraging him to, to dive deeper into his spiritual life, like following Christ. I wasn't doing any of that. If anything, I was encouraging him to continue sinning um, genuinely because that's what I wanted. I wanted to like be there. I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to have sex with him. I wanted to like basically play house and like do all of that. And he, I think, felt like responsible for me. And so he didn't want to like say, you got to go. But inevitably, like he told me he didn't love me anymore and I left. And so... Then I went back home. I was broke, busted and disgusted, <laughs> whole college degree and didn't have nothing to really look forward to. And so I went through that season where I got tapped back into uh, some of my sorority sisters who were helping me with doing Bible study, just growing in my faith, really understanding who Christ is. That was after I had you know, a time when I was like going to the club every weekend, smoking, drinking, like heavily, being highly promiscuous, just like out here because I was so brokenhearted after this relationship and this breakup happened. So I was really in a rough spot. Um, also just with like not having like a clear idea of what my future looked like. I ended up getting into grad school. I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, got my master's. And while I was in grad school, I met this guy who ended up being my boyfriend for about a year. And his family was very, very religious. They were like Church of Christ religious type. And I started going to church with them and they were the type where like they didn't even have like instruments in their church. Like it was straight you sang hymns and then heard the word and then that was it. It was very traditional in that sense. And so I embraced it at that time. I was very committed to, you know, like trying to be a godly woman, trying to like grow and feeling that tug from Christ to like follow him and learn about him but you know a lot of it was just to make my boyfriend at the time happy and then that's when I actually got baptized I actually got baptized on his birthday okay which you know is not something I'm necessarily like proud of but also like I don't allow that to take away from the fact that like I got baptized on August 9th 2015 uh, I was 24 years old. That for me was a turning point. I didn't plan it. I just simply that day we were at church and I was like, I think it's time for me to get baptized today. And mind you, I had been like, I guess, dedicated at, at, at like 10 years old or something like that. I don't know. It wasn't a real baptism when I was a child. It was some sort of like baby dedication slash kid dedication that me and my sister and my little brother did, but um, this was my baptism, like for real, dunked in the water, all the things. And that's when I started to like really embrace like, okay, like we're not gonna be having sex anymore. We're gonna be celibate, like, you know, dating, blah, blah, blah. But that's when things really started to shift for me. So um, I had some, now I can call it spiritual warfare, like going on, this was like, Lipstick and curls was like a thing, but this was like before it really started to get huge professionally. And I experienced some like letdown slash like spiritual warfare, like I said, with like some people I was working with at the time. And then I actually made the decision at the end of 2015 to like quit um, Lipstick and curls, like not being a content creator anymore. And when I wanted to quit, literally, things started happening that shocked me. I didn't realize I would hate some of the stuff that I was doing for my job that I had planned on like doing as a career but yet I hadn't officially pulled the plug on all my lipstick and curl stuff so I was still doing things on my own now. This is after Curls Over Brunch, this brunch tour I did um, years ago. If you went to Curls Over Brunch you're watching this video put a comment down below okay. Um, shout out to all my girlies that came to the Curls Over Brunch events back in the day. I thought that that would be the, you know, that was it. And then I get a cold email one day about being in a Colgate commercial. And then a couple weeks later, I get an email from a woman that ends up being my manager based in LA. And I've told this story before, but so many things started to happen for me after that. 
And I remember navigating that season like so uncomfortable, like I can't do what I thought I was going to do. I can't just go into higher education because clearly I've, I've grown enough to know that anytime God is trying to show you something, he's going to make you real uncomfortable on one side so that you have to go the other way. And then I also had this innate feeling like if I'm this scared about what could be, then maybe that's where I'm supposed to go. And that's all I needed. I got my little contract from Colgate. I had enough money from that to like, quote unquote, pay my rent for a year. That's all I had, $25,000. And I said, you know what? That's enough for me. <laughs> I have enough to, if nothing else happens in this year, I got enough to pay my rent and I'll be okay, figure it out. But I got to take a chance on this. So I ended up literally finishing grad school dragged myself across the stage because I was like, I'm not going to just not finish grad school. I was in my last semester. And even though I knew I wasn't going to work in the field, I would, and I was so over it by that point. Um, I knew that I wanted my degree. I wanted to be able to say, I finished this on the right note and nobody can take that away from me at the end of the day, even though I'm not really going to use, you know, what I did or my degree in that way. So fast forward, I'm getting all these opportunities as lipstick and curls. I'm traveling the world. I'm working with all these incredible brands. I'm literally making more money than I ever imagined I could make. I'm living on my own, living downtown Dallas and high rise and just like looking at my life like, oh my gosh, like I trusted God and it worked out. Then I met Mark just a few months later, like literally everything happened like so fast in this like six month period where everything just like took off. And I knew that like I was going the direction God wanted me to go, but I wasn't living the way he wanted me to live. I would here and there go to church or like I would pray regularly. That was one thing I did do, but I wasn't on a regular Bible study journey. I wasn't, um, you know, tithing. I wasn't doing any of that stuff. I was just kind of like living my life until 2018 when I came across Michael Todd and the relationship goals like series from Transformation Church. And at that time, my boyfriend at the time slash my husband now came out and confessed that he had cheated on me in our relationship. And essentially because he had been growing in his faith and his relationship with God, he knew that he had to tell me the truth and that he wanted to marry me and that he could not take that those lies into a marriage with me. So, you know, that was hard. And we talk a lot about that on our podcast, so I won't go too much deep into that here, but that was definitely a catalyst in us like okay like we gotta really start doing the work because how do you heal from that and how do you get over that and how should I really feel about that because I'm not your wife and I know one thing it don't say nothing about cheating on your boyfriend in the bible you know like you may not have signed the, no marriage paper but like we were living together we were having sex we were doing all the things living as if we were married but we were not and you know a couple months later i get pregnant with my daughter so i our daughter and so we get engaged while i'm pregnant but um you know we are at this point you know tried to find a church home in oregon because that's where we lived at the time in portland but it just wasn't we couldn't find a church home that like really stuck with us so we were really you know faithfully watching tc online at that point. So when the pandemic rolls around, we moved back here up to Dallas, back home, and we were still faithfully watching TC and growing in our faith and really making God and Christ like part of our lifestyle at this point. Because the pandemic really like put things into perspective too. And we also got married in 2020. And so we knew that, you know, when we got married and we had done our premarital counseling with our like pastors slash mentors, not at TC, this is like a totally different couple. We realized that like we wanted to have a righteous marriage. Like we wanted to do things the right way. We both had the desire to like do things God's way, but that did not soften the amount of healing we both needed as individuals and as a couple. And we had probably our roughest season in our relationship in seven years for the first two years of our marriage. Like it was hard. We loved each other, but we had so much crap 
from just like toxicity we had experienced you know trauma we had experienced but not healed from just like all that type of stuff that was just you know you gotta work through and you can't really work through it to its fullest capacity until you're in a safe environment and for a lot of people that safe environment is marriage because you know a lot of us don't have healthy family dynamics growing up like we're a product of our experiences right like and so for me the healthiest relationship I had ever been in was this one was my marriage while it wasn't quote-unquote perfect without flaw this was the most love that I was going to have so that I could heal um and that's what I needed that's what God knew I needed so through being a wife and becoming a mom like I was able to heal a lot of my traumas and that's really where Christ met me after I had smooth cussed out been um terrible to my husband like I felt the love of Christ Holy Spirit for the first time in the middle of a fight and literally when I was giving my husband the business I'm talking about going off on him okay off he turned and looked at me and he said I love you and gave me a hug at one of the most shocking moments because in my heart I was like how did you do that like how did you just turn around after everything I've said and done and just love me like that and express it to me and hug me like that and it was genuine how did you do that because that's not an option when I'm mad <laughs> Like, when I'm angry, when I'm all, you know, out of whack and, you know, in that mode, that crazy, like, you know, we going off on each other mode, I'm not even thinking about hugging you or telling you to, like, that I love you. That's not even an option. But that day it was for him, and that's how I knew. I said to him, whatever that is, I want that. And it was wild because I had been saved for, at this point, five years, five or six years. And I had never experienced that before. I never experienced that type of love before in action. It stopped me in my tracks and it literally changed me in an instant. And from then on, I was locked in. I was kicking and screaming at times because the flesh of in me and the things that were in me that needed to come out, uh, those spirits that were still in me from hurt and trauma and things that I had allowed, things that I had tasted before I was supposed to taste and things that I did and used to think, you know, things I used to think and believe and how I used to operate, that stuff had to come out, but I had to become aware of those things first. And sometimes when you're on your walk with Christ, you think that like, I'm set free, I'm in this, freedom place i you know i'm i'm now i'm saved by christ i have a relationship with him i'm in him but sometimes i don't even i'm not even gonna say sometimes every time for everybody who's really saved the journey of going from a babe in christ to actually a disciple of christ is painful it's that refining by fire it's that pruning that you know clipping off of dead ends and um, putting to the test whether or not you're going to bear the holy spirit's fruit in a situation you don't know if you're going to bear good fruit until you're in the situation so until you're in a situation where somebody is popping off at you and you could pop off back but instead you bear fruit of patience you bear fruit of forgiveness you bear fruit of compassion you don't know if that's the fruit you're gonna bear until the, the time is right. And so people don't talk about that. People don't talk about the season when you're truly trial and erroring your way through your faith. It was a couple years of feeling like every time I tried to do something right, every time I tried to get it right, I got it wrong. Or I would get something right and then I do something else, not even realizing that I was wrong and being like, wait, 
Where does it say in the Bible that you can't X, Y, and Z? Or you can't do this, you can't do that. Or I didn't even realize I was talking crazy about somebody. I'm so used to gossiping. I'm so used to feeling like some people are better than others that it's so wrapped up in the way I think and the way I talk that I'm not even understanding how I'm not actually loving people the way I'm supposed to be. And that's hard. And that's why I believe that God will surround you with someone or people who can love you through that season because it's gonna take love because you're gonna make mistakes. You're not gonna get it right. You're gonna say one thing and do another and you're not going to think that you are worth or really saved. You'll question it. You'll be like, I'm saved, but like, how am I still capable of doing X, Y, and Z if I'm in Christ? Like, I'm not supposed to want these things no more. <laughs> like, I'm a, new, I'm a new being, right? Like, I'm a new person. So like, why do I still want the things that I wanted before that are not good for me? That God specifically has said, like, you need to like turn away from these things. You know, like, why do you still want them? It's because when you become a new creation in Christ, when you are born again, that's spiritual. Your flesh is still the flesh. Your flesh does not hit control alt delete when you are born again. You just have another, you have a new life in Christ and a new power that has been unlocked for you that can help you be able to diminish your flesh, to control your flesh so that you can actually like operate and walk in the spirit instead of allowing your flesh, your carnal mind to run you and your emotions to run you. I remember there was a time when like, if I felt it, I had to do something about it. Like if I felt a feeling, I had to act on it. There was no like choice. And I started to realize as I grew spiritually, like there's always a choice. You choose how you want to proceed. You can feel a lot of things and a lot of things can influence you. Like a movie can influence you, a person can influence you, a song can influence you, a smell can influence you, right? But it's a matter of like, how strong are you to be able to say, hey, that influence isn't a good one. And even though my flesh is perked up by it, because I'm spiritually strong, I am able to say no and to actually choose for myself what I want. Because you're always making choices. Even when you feel like I can't help but get mad when somebody offends me, God gave you free will. God gave you agency. And what the enemy has done is made us believe that our agency doesn't matter and our agency is conditional. And it is sometimes because once you give the enemy legal right to operate in you by operating in sin, that's, that's you saying, okay. So then you start living with these you know, spirits of the enemy in you, around you for so long that you start to feel like they, they're the ones telling you what to do. Your anxiety is saying, you got to get out of here. You got to run. Or your depression is saying, you don't need to be in here anymore. You might as well just call it a day. You know what I mean? Um, when you start to feel like you no longer have a choice, that's not God. And he wants us to be sober minded because in sober mindedness, we can actually discern when we're being asked a question or asked whether or not to do something. And we can actually exercise the dominion and the choice that we truly have because we have that ability in earth. Like we make the choices. And even when we think, I don't have a choice. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. So that was that was one of those lessons in, in my testimony that like took me the longest was like actually starting to break down like how many spaces in my life and areas in my life did I feel like I had no choice? And if I felt like I had no choice there, why was that? What did I need to actually repent for and reconcile with God? Maybe something from my past, maybe something that came from my parents or my family or whatever it was, but I needed to start 
doing inventory on why I was the way I was. Because I actually didn't like who I was deep down. I liked parts of me, but there were other parts of me that I didn't like and I didn't necessarily know for the longest time that I could change her. You can, you can. And that's how I began to grow in Christ and my husband was a vital part of my walk and helping me understand and getting me on the right page and just showing me how to even like operate as a Christian in a real way because my husband grew up in like full-on every Wednesday night Saturday revival Sunday multiple services like since he was a kid he lived in that like church culture world so when I met him I had no idea because he was so in the world. I never knew. The only thing looking back now that I think could have been an indicator of how he grew up was he did not have his first drink until he was 23 years old. And like I told y'all, I had my first drink at 12. So, but when we met, I didn't think that there was any difference between us. If anything, I felt like he was a little out there more than me. He's transparent about his walk as well. And he was promiscuous because he was a victim of sexual abuse, molestation by a pastor and family member as a child and a teenager. So, and also had an addiction to porn for 20 years. So he's public about all of this. And we talk about it on our podcast a lot. And he talks about it with um, on his page, but also he runs a men's Bible study. And they're very transparent on there as well. He, It's a private Bible study. They do it on Zoom on Wednesday nights. Um, so if you DM them at the memo for men on Instagram, um, you can get the link to join that Bible study. But he talking about it all. He's sharing it all. And he's really the example that I follow to be as transparent and honest and and vocal about like things that I've gone through, things that I've been through, and my testimony in general because I've seen him walk in freedom. I felt the love of God come from him out of anybody else for the first time. Like he he has helped me so much. And if he was on here right now, he would say the very same thing for me, that in different ways, I loved him in ways that like nobody else had loved him before. And so we've helped each other along this journey so much. And that's why I really encourage people, even if your partner isn't, you know, got all this stuff together, or like maybe they believe in Christ, but maybe they don't really like live like it or you both are operating in sin together whatever like I've been there I've done that and when I tell you that like God can redeem that God can redeem that relationship God can redeem your marriage I'm saying it from a real experience I'm a living testimony of that because now our marriage like it's so beautiful and so holy and so healthy and healed and the way we get to be with each other but also the way we are with our kids like it has transformed the trajectory of our family it's worth saying you know what this world <laughs> it's too much it's doing a lot and a lot of not good stuff been <laughs> they so loud out there for me it's been choosing christ and really allowing him to infiltrate every single part of my life from the way I am a person, to the way I'm a wife, to the way that I'm mother, to the way that I'm a friend, to the way that I am a sister, to the way that I am a content creator and influencer, to the way I put out content. Like it has changed everything and you will not see anything from me that is not glorifying him. If you know, you know. Jesus is about to be back real soon. He about to be back real soon. And the more of us that can be prepared for his coming, the better. Because then we will be ready to love people who aren't when the time comes. And until then, so that we can help usher more of our brothers and sisters into the body of Christ. Because that's what we're really here for.
to not just serve ourselves like the world will, world will tell us, but to serve our brothers and sisters. All right, y'all, the nails are off. Um, they're looking crazy rough. I'm tired, I don't feel like putting these on now after taking these off. I could just wait until tomorrow, but let's at least see. Let me see, because I could just do it now. 